Good afternoon. Uh, at this post-election seminar, I trust that we could talk about that for a while and might just have some comments about it during the Q&A period. Today, I will am delighted to reintroduce to you a good friend of the Schemmel Forum, and I might add, a very good friend of mine. Wayne and I met in the 1990s when I was at the National Endowment for the Humanities and he at the International Fellowship of Christians and Jews. Both of our organizations were interested in starting a national conversation. Neither of them got very far in that, but I must say that Wayne and I have been in conversation ever since. Today we find that our democracy is at stake. Our politics have changed from the usual two-party system of Republicans and Democrats to a much more fractious disconnect. As we witnessed the attack on the United States Capitol on January 6, 2021, we saw that the usual divide between political parties have gone much farther, bordering on warfare. Wayne will speak today of the crisis we are in and one of our country's greatest contributions to humankind, jazz. Please welcome him to the court, to the podium. Right. <laughs> Thank you, Sandra. Short and sweet. I just said to um, our table mate, uh, uh, Ro, um, that Sandra is, uh, she was complimenting something. And I said, Sandra is not prone to hyperbole except when it comes to introducing me. Um, and you should be skeptical. I will make one addendum to her comment about our having met when she was at NEH. Um, uh, I think, Sandra, there was some stuff, good stuff that came out of that. We did a series of national conversations on race, ethnicity, and culture. And we had a corporate partner in Aetna. They did not they, they they were kind of for public viewing, but in those days, in the uh, dark ages of the 90s, um, we I believe we broadcast them over closed circuit TV to different Aetna offices. I know, I see the head shaking, yeah, no. Um, over to different Aetna offices around the country and also through different Jewish federations. Um, but they were uh, amazing conversations with my dear partner, Sandra, at NEH, and we would have people like Charles Murray, and um, I'm old now, I can't remember. We had some cool people and who wouldn't necessarily be on stage. Yet. Lisa Ling, a young journalist, Lisa Ling, Antonio Villagarosa, uh, Tavis Smiley moderated one of them for me. And then we continued, Sandra, for several years, actually. I got a grant from someone to do um, community conversations at, through different um, uh, National Conference of Christians and Jews offices. So. And you were instrumental in that. But she is right that out of that project, I was blessed with two dear, dear friends, Sandra and Maury, who um, for some reason or another keep giving me an open microphone, which as I t like to tell people, uh, is a, a, a terribly dangerous thing to do to uh, a man of a certain vintage who was raised in the Southern Black Baptist tradition. Um, I, I should let you all know, I believe in full disclosure completely. And for some odd reason, I have repeatedly found myself in the company of wonderful neighbors and citizens of ours uh, who are people of faith. And while I was raised in this tradition, deeply steeped, and my dear deceased parents, my mother, I finally did wear her down when I was about 40, but uh, much to their chagrin, I'm pretty much a heathen these days. Um, and I don't suppose to laugh at that because people don't. Um, and uh, pretty much an avowed heathen, <laughs> but hopefully a good heathen. I tell people, the joke I tell people is that I'm definitely going to hell. I am, that's happening. But I can be a better person before I get there. So that's kind of my quest here in this next chapter of my life. Thank you. I, I appreciate the head nod. Um, I am today, did it change? Yes going to the, the talk that Sandra edited for me. I tend to be long-winded. I'm not going to do that today. I'm going to be very concise in my comments. I'm going to try to be fairly interesting as well. Um, Sandra edited my title down. She, she has not seen this, so she didn't know exactly what I was going to do. I like to spring things on her and on all of you. Um, uh, the title is On Democracy, Inequality, and Jazz Improvisation. 
And it is as Sandra mentioned that uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about our current state. Um, um, again, I've had the great honor of speaking to you all in this forum and also um, in a slightly larger forum uh, around the endowed fellowship that's here. And I've talked about jazz and democracy. Uh, jazz is a wonderful metaphor. You've heard this a lot. Uh, there are great musicians, Wynton Marsalis among them, who have talked about um, the power of jazz as a metaphor uh, for democracy, a functioning democracy. And I'll touch on that a little bit, but I'm going to talk a little bit more about the practical aspect of jazz improvisation in particular. Um, so we're going to talk about our current situation, our current democracy. Thank you, Pennsylvania, for Tuesday. Um, uh, uh, I, I was born and raised in the great Commonwealth of Virginia, and I'm a proud resident of Newark, New Jersey, downtown Newark. Um, which is, uh, to some degree, epitomizes um, our older cities in that it has gone through very, very difficult times. Uh, and yet people there, longtime residents, newcomers, um, business folks and others have made a commitment to this city and are struggling to uh, help it not just retain its former glory, but also achieve a new glory, a new, more diversified, more open, more inclusive glory. Um, so thank you, Pennsylvania. We're very excited about that. And we're going to talk about that, I hope, a bit. Um, again, I'm going to talk about inequality and go into a little bit of history you'll, you'll see in this and then the consequences. And then, of course, a bit about jazz and jazz improvisation. And I changed this last one. I had dialogue and discussion or Q&A or something like that. And at dinner last night, Sandra reminded me that her first book is, uh, was actually called uh, Democracy is a Discussion. And she talks about democracy being this living, breathing concept, entity, practice, and that it's really a conversation between and among neighbors um, who don't often look alike or think alike or sometimes don't agree, but it is this extended conversation. So I'm hoping that we'll have an extended conversation. And if I have proven to be so completely boring that you have no questions, you still can't leave because I've got questions for you. Surprise. And bear with me because I forgot to bring my water up here. And my gate is not because I'm just trying to be cool, um, which is you kids back there, y'all don't know anything about that. But in the 70s, you know, in my neighborhood, we used to walk like that. We used to call it a pimp walk. My mother hated that. She, <laughs> my grandmother too, but we liked it. Uh, I tore the meniscus in my knee recently, so I'm, uh, I'm probably gonna have to have surgery and I am gonna milk this for everything I possibly can. So you should feel very sorry for me today. Okay, oops. I would like that very much. Um, well, well, before we totally dive in, I should say, so I was just playing music. I did this last time, and I believe I talked about, I was just playing a little music off my phone, and our tech guy, I've forgotten his name, but thank you and a hand for him uh, putting up with me and all that he's going to do today. Um, first thing, I like to have, quote unquote, incidental music. I like music playing. But in keeping with the theme of this, um, Lots of folks understand, and, and I've been one of them who's talked about the role and power of the arts. Um, I always say that I don't, I'm not trying to turn artists into public policy makers, but we need to have artists at the table when we make policy. Right? And I'm not trying to turn every citizen into artists, although I would like for us all who don't feel that calling to make art, or at least to understand art and to consume it at a deep level, not out of charity not out of some, oh, let's just take care of them, let's, let's add it on. No, it's essential to our work. And if you don't believe me, start a meeting with a poem and see how it changes. I don't care what the meeting's about. Just, just have everybody read and think about a short poem. I promise you it's going to change the temperature in the room. Start a meeting with music. Start, have a meeting in a room with no art on the wall. I, I keep trying to turn you guys into social engineers, but go do this on your kids and on your neighbors. Have, a meeting, with, have a, a meeting in a room with no art on the wall at all, and then the next week do it with art in the room, on the wall. It changes. And we were just listening to, this is a playlist I have. I call, it's called Chill Me, because I like to, every now and then I get a little too, uh, too hyped up about things. So I have to chill myself out. And the first couple of tunes were, um, if, if, for those of you who are jazz fans, if it sounded like the Count Basie Orchestra, you were wrong. 
you were right, because it does sound like Count Basie, but it was not Count Basie. It was a very young Quincy Jones who had just put his big band together. Quincy had been arranging for Basie um, at, at a very young age. I think Quincy at this point is probably 24, 25 years old, and he's got a big band. He's put his own big band together. He's got a record contract with then ABC and Pulse Records. And a lot of these guys are veterans from the Basie Orchestra and others. And his arranging was very, very much in that style. And one of the tunes he wrote was for Lena Horne. She had just married an arranger, Lenny Drayton. It didn't last, but he wrote a beautiful tune for them. He took another song and arranged it. And I'd like to play that and just say a few words about it, because again, it's gonna dovetail into a couple of the things I'm gonna talk to you about. There, is, there was so much that went into that work, writing for 18 pieces, the voicings that were necessary, trying to get them all to play in the same fashion, trying to simultaneously establish his voice while separating it from his mentor and friend, Benny Carter, a contemporary of Basie's, and also from the Basie Orchestra. Um, there's so much that goes into it, and yet at the end of the day, we all get to enjoy it and not even sometimes consciously realize how it's affected us. So there's that piece. So you could clap for that, but not necessarily me right away. Okay, I warned you I talked too much. I'm gonna keep an eye on the clock and I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be quick. Yeah, I'm gonna be quick. Okay, our current situation. And feel free to interrupt me at any point with questions, but I promise you, I'm not gonna do the thing where I talk for 50 minutes and then 10 minutes for question. I really hope we can have a conversation. And like I say, I have questions for you if you're, if you're not uh, motivated to uh, ask any questions. Okay, a current situation. Many of you know this stuff. We talk about this in shorthand all the time, um, but these are some actual, there'll be some actual numbers and comments, I think, to back up. There is a profound mistrust of public institutions right now. Arguably, it's been going on for roughly 25 to 30 years, going all the way back to the book Bowling Alone, to the changes that have happened. There, there, there are changes that are reflected often in polls that ask us our opinion of things, but the, uh, the factors that cause those changes are often societal, they're individual, and all of them happening at the same time. So we can't, you, you really can't take out the technological changes that have happened over the past three decades. When those of us of a certain vintage, I'm going to look over at those young people. I'm glad y'all are here. Um, those of us of a certain vintage, I think we had three channels on television to watch. Four, if you had UHF, I think, right? The local PBS station, local public station, and then ABC, CBS, and NBC. So most people in the country were watching the same thing. I don't know if you guys watched. There's a, there was a great documentary on Netflix, I think, about um, Desi and Lucy Arnaz. Lucille Ball and, and I love those shows. I'd forgotten how important they were behind the scenes in television in Hollywood. But at one point, I think the show came, I Love Lucy came on Monday nights and the numbers are absolutely astonishing. What, 40, 50 million people were watching that same show. That's a major shift to today where a hit show has 8 million people. I mean, they talk about, I love The Sopranos, but I don't think Sopranos ever had more than six, seven, eight million viewers. That's, that's nothing compared to what Matt, MASH's C series finale had, what, 25 million people or something like that. So there are these changes that are going on that impact us. And so when you then have a pollster from Gallup coming in and saying, well, do you trust government? Along with all of the other things that have happened historically in this country and abroad, it's no surprise then that people have uh, much less confidence. And the Supreme Court, as you see here, there's a huge decline in trust of the Supreme Court. And no, no, you know, no big whoop. It had to do with the last decision. So the trust in the Supreme Court is down 11 points. And there are others. Actually, um, you can also track the uh, President Biden's uh, uh, declining numbers with a number of things that happened, that, some of which were completely out of his control. But the point is, we have a profound mistrust in some of our public institutions. Uh, confidence in the police below 50% and has been. It was The first time it happened was around the George Floyd murder, um, and it's happened again. And so we are struggling to trust those that we pay uh, to protect us. All three branches of government, by the way, are down. Congress, um, the, the, the thing about Congress is that there's been a lack of trust in Congress for roughly four or five decades since it's been measured. You can go back to the University of Michigan and uh, the Miller polls there, and you'll see that. The interesting juxtaposition has always been that while people don't trust Congress at all. 
they tend to reelect their particular congressman over and over and over, congressperson over and over again. So that's that's a that's a a, a bit of an interesting byproduct, I think, of our two party system, and those of us. Again, I like to think that young people are less um, uh, locked in place than am I, but I am a creature of habit um, and have to force myself to uh, um, really bring about individual changes while I want changes to happen at the national level. Or I want changes to happen in Scranton, but not in my neighborhood in Newark. Um, and so I won't, I won't belabor this point. I've talked about this before, the global rankings of democracy. Uh, there are a number of them now. The Democracy Index is one that's uh, generated by The Economist magazine. I like that one because The Economist magazine is kind of conservative. And so it's hard to criticize that they've been so liberal in the indices that they use to measure democracy. Um, but on all, even if you have quibbles with the democracy index, and there are people who do, um, mostly um, financial folks uh, who deal in commodities markets and global markets, um, they all are saying the same thing. And that is that the US has really dropped over the past really 20 years in how we function as a democracy. So our official rating is that we, we are a flawed democracy. I'll show you a picture next, but let me just make sure we, we, we know what they mean when they say a flawed democracy. And those are nations where elections are fair and free and basic civil liberties are honored, but may have issues, e.g. media freedom infringement. Nonetheless, these nations have significant faults in other democratic aspects, including underdeveloped political culture, low levels of participation in politics, and issues in the functioning of governance. It would be unheard of to say that about the United States 50 years ago. For, for all of our problems, for all of our problems, functioning governance, levels of political participation. And so, oops, go back there. This place is a, that's a, here, I'll, let me, ooh, what am I doing here? Bear with me. Uh, there we go. Um, so what that does, this is a map of the globe. And the darker colors, that's bad. <laughs> the dark red, those are authoritarian regimes. Uh, the lighter, lime green, um, those are ones that are more democratic. You'll notice uh, they've got a blow up here of um, Eastern Europe, Northeastern Europe. And you can see that our friends here are doing quite well, Norway, um, Finland. And here we, here's Canada which is a full democracy, they get an eight point something. We have a 7.8 if I'm not mistaken. And if I just do this one time, I can switch. And now we can see the Americas. And there, they have a number of indices on this. Um, and out of 167 countries, we are number 25. Yeah, I know. Uh, Finland. Yep. Real challenge for us. And this has stayed the same. Once we made that precipitous drop, um, first we dropped to 18. I think we were number 18 in maybe 2012. 2016, we dropped to 25, and we've stayed there. And I, I, I shudder to think if they actually factor in January 6th in the 2023, the 22 23 ratings. I don't know. Um, our economy has developed wage stagnation. You know this. Um, but what people may not know is that we've we were one of the few nations, I used to make this argument uh, to friends of mine, I'm pretty left, but I used to make this argument to friends of mine uh, on the left that uh, on the left we have not done enough, we haven't done a good enough job, um, we've done a very good job criticizing capitalism and free markets, I think. We haven't done a good enough job acknowledging where capitalism and free markets have worked for us. The United States was one of the few places on the planet where and even for black folks and even for women and, and other minority groups, telling me what your grandparents did didn't necessarily tell me what you do. That was very rare. At the end of the, uh, midway through the 20th century, <laughs> and I mean in other developed countries, you can look at the UK, you, people will tell you, I do the same thing my grandfather did. Um, that was not true for us for a long time. That started to change in the early 80s during the Reagan years and has completely declined. So among Americans born in the early 1980s, only half earned more than their parents did at a similar age. And that's getting worse. By comparison, at the age of 30, more than nine out of 10 Americans born in 1940 were earning more than their parents had at the same age. 
Now think about that. 90% of that generation earned more than their parents did. This is a challenge for us. Um, and of course, for black households, it's been more, again, you know, we're the canaries in the coal mine, along with a couple of other groups, Native Americans are, uh, um, in particular have struggles. Um, and so the, our net worth has actually dropped by half. So whenever there's an economic crisis, it's going to hit more vulnerable communities. One of the groups that gets left out, it's hard to find data on them because they're not typically not stratified that way. But um, poor white households. Um, but if you take a look at communities across Appalachia and in certain parts of the Rust Belt, you will see very similar, sometimes worse numbers than for African Americans. Very similar. Okay, wage inequality. Um, um, the inequality is increased. Everybody knows the conversations about that. You know the numbers around CEO pay, um, which I always find interesting because it's not like um, if you go back to the uh, first half of the 19th century, when the average CEO made 18 times more than their average worker. It's not like those CEOs were hurting. <laughs> you know, John D. Rockefeller still did very well running Standard Oil. He was fine. He had a nice house. But the gap between he and his average workers uh, was not that. And now I think it's 500 times uh, the lowest worker. It's about 300 and something times the average worker. That's an incredible concentration of growth. I'm saying all of this because it's, it's important to understand, I think, particularly for some of our more disgruntled neighbors and, and fellow citizens, the factors that have caused that and how that affects all of us as well. Um, CEO pay, homelessness, these are official numbers. Roughly three quarters of a million Americans are homeless. And I, I think the number's higher, of course, um, because there are the uh, people who aren't um, counted accurately. Um, but the, the very interesting thing is that if you look at this last sentence here, uh, it's disproportionately black. Probably could have guessed that. Disproportionately middle-aged, which is a surprise. Veterans are veterans. For all the lip service that some of us give to um, supporting the military and rah, 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 I've said to some conservative friends of mine, I said, okay, let's raise our taxes. Let's raise our taxes to everybody 2% so we can beef up the VA hospitals. We can raise the pay of enlisted men and women, enlisted men and women, privates. Have privates going into the military make $50,000 a year. I can't get anybody to bite. So we pay lip service to it, but we are not taking care of are, are some of our most vulnerable, not just poor folks, but folks who have served us. Um, I'm going to speed through some of this because it's terribly depressing, by the way. When, when I was pulling this together, I actually cut a couple of slides because I was like, Wayne, you kind of, I'm getting depressed reading this, although it's true. And it is important to think about it because, again, we're setting the stage for where we are today and what we need to do. And I, I, not just to cry the blues, but to leave here, I think, empowered to try and do something. Understanding the urgency, but also empowered. That's where jazz is going to come in. Okay. Uh, too many children in poverty. This is a good one because it's a good one. It, it, it's important one because, again, on a global scale, none of our first world countries are near us in terms of the poverty rate among uh, um, children. It's, it's just, it's, it's crazy. Um, yeah, we won't, I'll skip over that. The income, again, the wealth gains have gone to the highest 10%, really to the top 2% of that group. But the top 10% are doing fine. They're a little bit different than the top 2%. There's a great book called The 9.9% .9 Majority. Um, it's really, I recommend it highly. Um, and it makes a distinction between sort of the ultra super crazy wealthy and folks who are really doing okay and how a lot of folks who are doing okay are part of the problem. Um, and I'm going to talk about the lack of empathy that we have. And again, part of what part of what got us there. Uh, so let me just kind of breeze through this. Salaried workers, unions are down. That's hurt us. Um, the incarceration rate, you know all about this. So the question becomes, how did all of this come about? How did we get there? And I'm not going to go crazy with this. And I am not an historian, but it's important to talk about history. So the beginnings of this country, uh, for those of you who read the 1619 Project, and I commend it to you, please. If you don't read anything else, read the intro. It is a tour de force. Oh, I know I probably shouldn't say anything about y'all leaving, but I'm going to. You better go to class, study hard. 
Do what your parents say, okay? And pay social security. Be nice to old people. <laughs> I tell my students that all the time. They told me that I should support uh, loan forgiveness. And I was like, I do totally support loan forgiveness. Are you kidding? But it's insane that we penalize our kids who are trying to educate themselves and be able to pay taxes and have a home and help us pave streets and not get into trouble and, and not commit crime. That's crazy that we penalize them. Yeah, did you point because you were going to say something? Oh, you're just affirming. Yeah, OK. Um, OK, so how do we get here? Um, one of the things the 1619 Project lays out so beautifully are these twin beginnings of uh, this great experiment here coming over to a populated land and sort of just planting a flag notwithstanding. This, this great experiment in self-governance and selling human beings, selling and buying human beings so they'll have to work for us. I'm saying it like it's like there was no historical precedent. Of course, there have been other historical pre precedents for that. It is something that humans do. Um, but those twin beginnings are extremely important. So again, 1619, in my beloved Virginia, uh, when the first black folks arrive on a ship, um, and just a few weeks later, the, the first assembly, first assembly of Europeans hold a vote. There have been governance before among native peoples, but this is the first time Europeans who had come here were holding a vote to govern themselves. This is absolutely amazing, but it's important because the two grow together. Here's how. Really have to understand cotton. There's a great book, Empire of Cotton. It came out maybe five or six years ago. And you can take a look at this while I'm talking, but the key thing to look at, I thought I highlighted this. By 1850, cotton was a global commodity and the U.S. was beginning to dominate this. Over the next 11 years, the U.S. goes from exporting 8 million pounds of cotton to 80 million in the mid-19th century. That's astonishing. And they surpassed Great Britain, which had been the big one. They were buying stuff from India, buying cotton from India, turning it into textiles, and selling it all over the world. The U.S. surpasses England during that time. This is, huge. this is the equivalent of the tech sector boom in this country blowing up. Suddenly, you've got all these wealthy folks. There's all this money being made. There's all this opportunity. And read this quote from the American cotton planter, because of course, they had to have a newsletter. It's like their own lobbying group. They had a, you know, with all of us cotton planters, we're making so much money, we need to be in touch with each other, exchange best practices. And this is astonishing. The slave labor must also continue, for it is idle to talk producing cotton for the world supply with free labor. That's crazy talk. It has never yet been successfully grown by voluntary labor. This is, this is one of our, it's like the Chamber of Commerce getting together and like, yeah, we got to do this. 80% in 19, 80%, uh, 80% of our country's GDP was linked to slavery. So even those of us, I, as I say, I grew up in the great Commonwealth of Virginia. I tell people Virginia is as far north as you can get and still be south. And I'm not from that. Northern Virginia, those Yankees up outside D.C. No, no, Portsmouth, baby, right 30 minutes from the North Carolina border. That's right. I love my state with all of its mess and all of its craziness. Um, folks in the North, can't, you can't fool yourselves that you weren't a part of it. The shipping industry in New England, they were building ships to, to trade slaves. There's a great documentary called Traces of the Trade. I encourage you to watch it. It's from a very, the, one of the great grandchildren of a very prominent New England family, the, the Wolf, the DeWolf family, um, shipping magnates. This is old money. Um, and she did a wonderful documentary talking to her peers and her family about where the family money came from, which they kind of cleaned up. They had a G-rated version that there were these characters, these colorful characters in our past who made all this money, but they were in shipping. They were in shipping, trading slaves. They'd go to West Africa, stop in the Caribbean, Brazil, stop in um, Puerto Rico, Norfolk, Virginia, back up a triangle, Oops. trading rum and molasses and coming and selling it and starting and going to get people, selling them in all. 80% of the nation's GDP was linked to slavery. There's a lot of conclusions you can draw from that. One is this, you could totally see the laws that were made in support of that. You could also draw the conclusion that it is astonishing that there were people who fought against this. 
who made a choice to not engage in just self-interest, to, to be class traders. And there always was a very strong movement there. Okay. Um, this is, th this slide is something I think is important. There have been a lot of conversations, studies, books written, people talking about, you know, the origins of, of racial animus. And even just in the past 10 years, a couple of uh, psychologists whose work I, I respect very much talked about where this comes from. And they talk about the other and dislike of the other and in-group and out-group. I think all of that work is completely flawed. Um, and I think it's flawed for this reason. People typically think that part of the reason folks were able to um, support slavery or live next door to it or just turn their blind eye to it or even say this is a good thing because of this pre-existing animus, this pre-existing difference. Oh, I maintain, I argue that the success of this country financially, the opportunities, the way it enveloped everyone necessitated racial animus. You had to create stereotypes. You have to dehumanize folks. How else do you live with it? How do you live with it? For my little pieces of evidence, I don't have it here, but I can, if you can read it, it's a very thick and beautifully written, incredible book, um, The History of White People by Nell Irvin Painter, who is a professor emeritus at um, Princeton. Um, she's an artist. She actually, after she retired from being this incredibly dynamic historian, Nell, who's African-American, um, decides to become an artist. I guess she wanted to be an artist. Turns out she's a great artist. So if you Google her now, you're probably going to see her art first. But she has written a seminal book on this, The History of White People. Read the first two or three chapters because it's, it's about this thick and it's very dense. But one of the things that emerges is that you can't find examples of white people referring to themselves, what we think of as white people, referring to themselves or other people that we now think of as white people as white in history prior to the antebellum South. Prior to, prior to the early, mid 17th century here in the States. Can't find it. They, they're Romans, they're from this country, they're Swedes, and they, it's not that they don't see color differences, they do. The Moors, there was a Moorish guy, Wayne, who showed up yesterday and he brought a saxophone and he played jazz. That happens all the time. They don't refer themselves as white and they don't see it as a racial category. We invented it here. And again, if you, this is there's too much to read on this. There's, um, uh, notes on a Slave State by Thomas Jefferson, which were contemporary notes about uh, the Great Commonwealth, but it also includes notes to other plantation owners, things you could do, best practices, you know, don't let Wayne learn how to read, that'll be a problem, don't, you know, that kind of thing. That stuff is important because you can see that over the course of roughly 40 years, from 1619 to about 1650 or so, 1660, a series of laws were passed. Didn't all happen at once. There was indentured servitude, which everybody knows, right? It did not discriminate by race. Black and white could be indentured servants. It's about, I, I think I was telling Maury, I should have looked this up, Maury, to confirm it, I will. I believe it's nine or 10 years in. So 1619, the first black folks arrived. Uh, 16, something like 1625, six, seven, eight, nine. There's an example where the first time that the law made a distinction between someone that we now think of as white and somebody black. Two indentured servants run off together. This used to happen. They both get caught. They get different sentences just based on one being black, African, and one being European. First time. Then over the next 25 years, there are a series of laws passed. And you'll note it coincides with the growth of cotton with the cotton industry. So that by the time you're 1650, 1660, 1670 or so in Virginia, they have done a couple of things. They have tied being indentured to a lifetime sentence. So if you're black, you are a slave forever. If you have a child, that child is a slave. This was the first time this was new. Indentured servitude had nothing to do with the child that you made. Uh, uh, half before prior to this. That child was a slave and that child was a slave for life. It took a while but it happened. This is critical. This is critical. This tells us that, wait a minute, <laughs> this didn't just, there wasn't some pre-existing animus. Oh, 
Africans were disenfranchised, didn't have a government to go complain to. They had been sold, we'd been sold and paid for, at least by European standards. So I say all of that, and I'm taking too much time, I apologize. I say all of that to say, now you have to reconcile it. Because remember, most people weren't homeowners. Most people weren't homeowners. Most people weren't planners. They were, they're working. And you know that this human being next to you is a human being just like you. Sometimes people fall in love, so we got to make some laws to stop that. Sometimes this person was the best person to run the plantation, but that's not a good thing because, mm, that's going to support the abolitionist movement, so we got to make sure people don't know that. Right? And so this is, for me, this is empowering information. Why? Because this is something that we can change. If whiteness is a category that you just opt into and not a condition of this, people can opt to not do it. And so now when you hear these kids saying, reject whiteness, reject whiteness, I've had friends like, Wayne, how am I going to reject myself? I was like, that's not you. You don't have to be that. What they mean is reject the status that came with that. And remember, the status at the time was, I'm indentured. I can get out of this. Because they still had indentured servants, by the way. There was, an, there was an overlap between chattel slavery and indentured servitude until it eventually became only indentured servitude. So you still have folks who are indentured. Eh, I'm, I'm out seven years. I've worked. I've saved up money. And that person is looking at me and saying, I know it's not right that Wayne has to do this forever, but wow, am I really going to? throw my life away. I, I don't know. I don't know what's in there. I don't know the decisions one makes then. But for us now, a couple of centuries later, right, now some things fall into place. I was saying to someone the other day, we, they were, we were talking about the Supreme Court is almost certainly going to gut affirmative action in, in uh, higher education, which is not a great thing. But I'm honestly not so broken up about it because I just... I'm the product of a, I had a wonderful college education. I love my alma mater. I had my 40th reunion recently. I was one of the speakers. Da 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 da. Uh, I just don't think the action in this country is in these elite private institutions. I think the action is in public institutions, like the University of Scranton, for example, like Rutgers University, Newark, in downtown Newark. And like I say, I am a proud graduate of Stanford University, love it, blah, blah, blah. My classmates are rock stars. Some of you have done great things. But in terms of this country, in terms of the public conversations that we need to have, we need to be talking about educating. I want a school teacher in, in Scranton. I want a cab driver in Brooklyn to have had a great education. I want artists to, to know exactly what they're doing. And when they're breaking down walls, I want them to know exactly what walls they're breaking down as they try to create new art for us. I want that. And, and you're not going to do it at the elite schools. The elite schools are fine. They're going to do their thing. And, and the kids that come out of them will be, you know, whatever they're going to be. Um, but the conversations that we should have have to be around, I think, state public institutions, junior colleges, vocational training. Vocational training that also teaches folks how to be good citizens, which is a requirement. Okay, I am talking too much. Sorry. And y'all are too quiet. You should tell me. Somebody should be doing this. Um, Frederick Douglass warned us about inequality, and that came out. Um, I just, I highlighted this. I started to do a better job because I was supposed to just go through these and just read the boldface stuff. Um, the question I ask is, what's the cost of that level of lying? to yourself and to others for centuries, right? Have you ever seen any of the pictures of lynchings? That's a great showstopper at dinner, by the way, if you want to drop. I don't know what y'all are going to be doing at Thanksgiving. Hey, have you ever seen? Um, some of, in some towns in our country, you know, these were like public things. So you have these pictures of people, they got this sun on their shoulders and there's a burning charred body that's been desperate, horrible, horrible things. The thing I always thought about were two things. What do those people go home and think, talk about later? And that's just the town square. What about the other people who were home who were appalled, who couldn't believe it? Like all of us watching January 6th, like, oh my God. Do you pick up a shovel and go brain your neighbor and kill him? Probably not, right? But how do you live with that? Is it the all of these horrible things have taken a terrible toll on all of us, on good people, otherwise good people. This is why these kids are pushing us 
with all kinds, these kids, we should be pushing ourselves too. And we, a lot of us did it when we were young. These kids are pushing us on all kinds of things, opening up. And I, eh, some of it may be they're going too far. But the kids, they're supposed to. No, Wayne, you have to call them they. They, well, how many of them are there? I'll say, you know, I tell my students, I say, well, be gentle with me because these are pronouns I'm not used to using. But they're pushing us because they're trying to open things up. And we have not done a good job of it. We've been so closed. We're the people who were not at the lynching, but we were at home, right? And it's, I said this to my classmates when I was speaking, you know, we, comfort is overrated. Being comfortable is overrated. It really is. And I say that in my, in my uh, I, I, I'm a man of a certain vintage here, um, having just been to my 40th college reunion. But comfort is overrated. Intellectual comfort is definitely overrated. We have got to stay involved. We've got to work with these young people who are pushing us and driving me crazy. Because there's a bunch of stuff we know that they need, but they don't know. But they have an urgency and, and a restlessness that we need lest we continue this for another century. We have an opportunity right now. We're at a crossroads at an inflection point to really bring about change in this country. We're gonna have a woman president. The next person that runs, whether it's Kamala Harris or anyone, hopefully they won't be as savaged as Hillary Clinton was, but they're gonna get savaged. There's gonna be all kinds of things said about this person. And I promise you, whatever folks think, I have friends, who, friends on the left who just hate Hillary Clinton. I keep saying, you guys, you don't have to change one thing. If she were a man, she'd have been president. I, <laughs> I said to folks, listen, by the way, if you want to really get, if you want to really understand racial discrimination, look at gender discrimination. We used to say that when it comes to race, anything becomes possible. Anything becomes possible. So you read tomorrow morning that, oh my God, Wayne Winborn was arrested for drugs. I said, there are going to be people who said, I didn't know Wayne was a drug deal, <laughs> as opposed to that couldn't possibly happen. They'd say, oh, he was a drug. Anything becomes possible. Hers Herschel Walker. For Senate? Senate? Come on, Republican friends of mine. It's insulting. People should be insulted. He hasn't even taken it seriously. He hasn't done any homework. And we know the only reason they plucked him from Texas to do it, to run, was because Raphael Warnock's black. This is how little they think of their constituents. They think people aren't going to be able to say, he's an idiot. Oh, yeah, he happens to be black, but he's an idiot. And apparently it's kind of working. Okay. Chaz. Oh, wait, wait, wait. I got to go back because this is important. I said I wasn't going to do this. I'm going to wrap up, I promise. Um, the consequences of this, I think, are, and again, it's hard to think about, y'all. I know. I know. It, it is. And, and there's a great coffee table book on lynching. I don't suggest you buy it and put it on your coffee table, although it's profound. But you should go to Montgomery, Alabama and go to the lynching memorial because it, it, it is so many things all at once. It's an astonishing piece of art. Provocative. It is so educational because one of the things, it is very simple in its design and beautiful in its design. One of the things that happens, though, is that you go along all these places and they have it cataloged different ways. And so you're looking at bronze and it's kind of rusty bronze. And they have um, the accounts of what happened with different lynchings. And I'm, I'm no student of lynchings. Maybe I will be at some point. Turns out, not sure why, a lot of lynchings happened on holidays, national holidays. If you go, you're going to be shocked at how many lynchings happened on Thanksgiving Day or Christmas Day or New Year's Day. And I'm thinking again, did they then go home and carve the turkey? And the reasons that people were lynched. The guy was lynched because uh, he was a farmer. And he wanted to charge the same amount for his grain that the white guy in the stall next to him was. He got lynched that night. A pastor married this uh, interracial couple, a white woman and a black man. They lynched the pastor first for marrying them. I'm telling you, it's astonishing. The other reason to go, by the way, is because Montgomery is a beautiful city. It's a wonderful city, and they're trying. They're trying to get the downtown together. And for those of you, I can't remember if Pennsylvania is an open carry state, but it's a little disarming to see a sign as you go into the Radisson or the Hilton, you know, please leave your firearm in the car. 
Yeah, open carry. Virginia is now an open carry state, too. So the first time I saw a guy with a gun on his holster walking into the sports bar that I was in, I was like, oh, OK. <laughs> yeah, we have work to do, y'all. But what this does, again, this is so disturbing. This is what I'm saying. Don't be comfortable because we need to know this. It, again, it helps us understand what are the consequences of this. I think after centuries of this, it's made us hard. It's definitely made our neighbors hard. The lack of empathy between among folks is absolutely astonishing. There's a book called Dying of Whiteness. It's kind of fun, it's written by a journalist. I shouldn't say, it's not fun, it's devastating. And he talks about things like, the, the example I tell people, he does an interview with this man who is dying of something curable, I've forgotten what it was. But he's in a state that didn't go for Obamacare. And next door, I don't know if it's Kentucky and Tennessee, I forget which one, southern states. Um, next door is a state that did. If he'd been in that state, he would have gotten care earlier, probably wouldn't be on his deathbed. And he interviews this guy and says, hey, do you regret be, you know, being against Obamacare? And the guy says, no. If it was going to benefit immigrants and, and blacks and all of these undeserving people, I'd still rather die. What do you do with someone who thinks that, right? How did they get there? How do, why is it that we, among all of these First world nations, our, our, our friends in the Western world, we think that social welfare, social welfare is an undeserved benefit. Undeserved. I think it's because of centuries of having to justify this and the stories we tell. And when kids say, wait, why do all those, I want to go over to Wayne's neighborhood and play. No, 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 you can't go there. It's too much crime. Well, why is there too much crime? But we, if it's not structural, it's got to be us. We're just criminal folks. By the way, um, another the, the, all of this information is out there, by the way. This is, this is one of the things that give us hope. All of this information is out there. There's a great uh, Netflix documentary, 13th Amendment. And again, just the opening couple of panels, look at it, you know. And if you look at the incarceration rates in southern states, but particularly Mississippi, right? Look at the incarceration rates. Right before slavery ends, black population of the jails were like 2%. 10 years after slavery, black population of the jails is 60%. Because we're lazy and we're committing crime. The people who had just been working for free for a couple of centuries are suddenly lazy. No, they had to start criminalizing that behavior. Because there were folks opening up their own, trying to be planters, trying to have... That's, that's a whole other talk I'll talk to you about. The point is... There is a corrosiveness that happens. And I think it really goes far to explaining why folks don't forget helping people that don't look like them. They don't want to help folks who live near them. You can't even have conversations about, again, the loan forgiveness. I've had several students, they just assume because I'm a certain age, I'm against, as one person, a friend of mine said, why would I, just because I got hazed, why do I want you to be hazed? Of course I'm against loan, I'm for loan forgiveness. We do it all the time in this country. The PPP loans got forgiven. Have we forgotten the bailout of the auto industry? The numbers are astronomical. We can't even. And do you remember, by the way, we couldn't get Congress to vote to limit the CEO pay because somehow no one will want to go run Ford Motor Company if you can't pay them unlimited money? It's ridiculous. Of course they're going to want to run Ford Motor Company. There'll be some men and women in Scranton who wouldn't have gotten a shot who'd be happy to go run it and do a great job. So, okay. Mm -hmm. da -da -da, I won't, we won't go through that. Okay, here we go. So what are we supposed to do in this? This is here's history again. Okay, so I have two quotes here from Albert Camus and James Baldwin, and they're gonna, it's a total switch, you guys. I love this one. In a world, because I wish I could write like this. In a world whose absurdity appears to be so impenetrable, we simply must reach a greater degree of understanding among men and women, a greater sincerity. Now, this is Camus talking after World War II. And he's he didn't like the term absurdism, but he's associated with absurdism. So this is a French Algerian in France, right? Talking about sincerity, a greater understanding between and among us. Trying to understand and explain World War II, which was horrific, which was crazy to see people doing this to one another. James Baldwin, it's a great conversation he did with Margaret Mead. I think you can actually find videos of it. He says, we've got to be as clear headed about human beings as possible because we are still each other's only hope. James Baldwin saying this. 
who had to leave this country for a while to keep his sanity because it was so much discrimination. It's hard to be that smart and that talented, right? And that to, to have been African-American at that point. That's profound. So now how do we get to that? I think jazz. I think jazz improvisation gives us a metaphor, gives us hope, and gives us a way forward. The blues, I'm not going to talk about the blues so much, but jazz allows people to see others across difference as fully human which is a critical requisite for us to be able to work together. We have got to, I always say, I get in these conversations, I say I'm pretty left and I'm hanging out with friends of mine who are left of us. And I said, okay, let's put, put, all this, put all this stuff Wayne just talked about aside. Let's just pretend we're in power. What do we do with our neighbors? What am I gonna do, what am I gonna do with Marco Rubio or Ted Cruz? Yeah, I, I don't wanna be them. <laughs> I don't wanna do to them what was done to us. Right? So how do, and I'm no Boy Scout, right? We're just regular people sitting around a table trying to engage in a democratic experiment. I think the jazz gives us, jazz gives us a way to do that. And a lot of people are already getting this. I have a note here to tell you about, and I'm gonna stop talking. I'm gonna talk a little bit, just a few seconds more. Um, my colleague, Stefan Harris is a great musician, four or five time Grammy nominee, um, one of the most important musicians of his generation, great jazz improviser, thinker, thought leader. He very recently, over the past couple of years, has been called upon to do talks in corporate America. He's like a darling in the tech sector to their boards, their leaders. You can find, he, you can easily find him online, but if you go to YouTube, if you just Google, there are no mistakes on the bandstand. He did a video that went viral, and that's how Forbes ran it and other folks, and now they pull him in. And he says, there are no mistakes on the bandstand, meaning there's no mistakes, it's just an opportunity. So when someone plays, and he tells the story of the first time he played with Wenton, and he's, I think he's at Carnegie Hall, and he was just killing it. His first time taking a solo, and he hit a wrong note. It, and it was the end of the concert, and he says, I hit a wrong note. And this all happens like in seconds. And he says, I was mortified. And I hear Wenton yell out, play it again! And he hit it and went and took the band and they found that note. And the crowd, at the end of the song, the crowd goes absolutely nuts. Dizzy Gillespie used to say, at any given moment in a piece of music, you're only a half step away from the right note. <laughs> if you know music, right? You get, so jazz becomes this way of approaching our problems in a different manner. Stefan talks about radical empathy. He talks about, and he does this demonstration. I'm, I'm not supposed to name the companies, but again, big, I mean, it's amazing to me, the companies that we all know. He does this demonstration with his band where he'll say, he'll tell the guys what to play, and then they play it. And then he does one where he doesn't tell them what to play. Like, you listen. And again, these are corporate leaders. They can see and hear the difference in the outcome because the musicians have to listen to one another. They have to trust each other. They have to sort of simultaneously subsume their ego in service of the collective and yet be good enough to respond in the moment. That's what improv improvisation does for us. That's what we're gonna need going forward because we are in an absurd circumstance. Logic isn't gonna get us there. I don't think a roadmap is gonna get us there. Ugh. Okay, there's all this stuff about jazz, diligence, commitment, da, da 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 Last thing I'll say, two things I'm gonna say last. One of the mistakes that people make about jazz improvisation is that, that you think, a lot of people think the musicians are just getting up there, just winging it and just making it up. No, there is so much discipline required. There is so much diligence and practice required. The, a famous musician once said to, to somebody who was asking him, man, how can you charge? I think it was Ornette Coleman and Ornette Coleman, uh, didn't play a lot in New York as much as he should have because he refused to lower his price and whatever the number was. And it was a big number because he's like, I'm Ornette Coleman and I'm 60 some years old. And if it, I don't know if it was Ornette or not, but whomever it was, they said, um, someone said, how can you possibly charge $100,000 or $50,000 for a 90 minute concert? And he said, those people didn't pay $100,000 for those 90 minutes. They paid $100,000 for the 30 years I spent preparing for those 90 minutes, right? You pay a lot of money for your surgeon, not <laughs> for the 20 minutes, for everything they did to get themselves. You pay a lot of money for your lawyer, that partner at a law firm, for what they did. It's the same thing. And that is going to be required of us. Okay, this is the quote from uh, uh, Trini Jashrina Vazen, who's a legend in the tech sector, but she's a humanist in the middle of the tech sector. She happens to be my life partner, thanks to one Sandra Myers, who uh, introduced us. Look, we're going to skip all of this, but if you just go to... 
here. We're in the throes of some kind of epical transition and we're either going to evolve or self-destruct. Shanita gave a talk from it. I don't think we meet a thriving future by someone coming up with a grand master plan and the rest of us following this strategy. Instead, we're called to evolve our roles as human beings and citizens to participate in and contribute to a collective emergent wisdom. If we can participate in life as improvisation, just as the universe shows us it's doing all around us all the time, see COVID virus, which improvises every time we come up with right uh, a, a vaccine, we can fulfill our roles as citizens in a multicultural pluralistic democracy towards mutual flourishing. I love all the words in there, mutual flourishing. We see improvisation around us in nature and in life. Oh, I went the wrong way. Why did I go? Here we go. Last quote. Herbert Shivade, who passed away, great activist, thinker. Um, you can see all this. But here's the piece that all of this is great. She gave a speech at the March on Washington in 1993, uh, obviously advocating for LGBTQI, other alphabets, rights. And I'm going to get them because these young folks are pushing me to get them. And I, I, what happened to just LBGT? No, I'm going to get them. I'm going to work on it because it's expanding my mind. Um, same thing with the disability community, by the way. She says, we call for the end of the world as we know it. We call for the end of racism and sexism and bigotry as we know it, for the end of violence and discrimination and homophobia as we know it, for the end of sexism as we know it. We stand for freedom as we have yet to know it, and we will not be denied. I love that. She didn't say, I'm not going to fight for some trucker Republican dude. She didn't say, I'm not going to fight for folks in the South. She didn't say people I agree with. She said she calls for all of that. The end of all of that. Such an incredibly powerful statement. So let me stop. <laughs> Did I say I wasn't going to do this? I told you guys to stop me. Okay, so let me stop and let's have a question. And I got questions for you if you don't. You don't have to clap. It's okay. First of all, I want to thank you. That was I didn't know what to expect when I signed up for this. This was superb. Thank and, you. You know, and I'm, and I'm not one to give flattery, so I appreciate take, take that. it. Um, <laughs> I have two, two questions. Number one is, how much do you think social media has contributed to the division of what's going on? That's number one. Number two, recently there was a PBS show about U.S. and the Holocaust. And you know, being, being Jewish and watching it, there were very few surprises. What was surprised is people that I'm friendly with that are not Jewish were absolutely astonished what was going on. And then thinking about what you were talking about with slavery, I wonder how much of the public education, especially in my age, was so sanitized so that it wouldn't be offensive or disturbing to kids in this country on these issues that we've, we've come to come to kind of like, oh yeah, it was bad, but uh, so what? You that know was what I mean? so long ago. Yeah, but I mean, <laughs> does that make sense at all? Thanks. Um, Yes, so in reverse chronological order. It was so long ago, Louis C.K., um, before his fall from grace, used to have a great joke that when people would say that about him. He was like, it was 150 years ago. That's two old ladies living to be 75 back to back. That's nothing, that's your great, great grandparent. That's, it wasn't like so long ago. More importantly, it, it's not like it came to an end and that was it. Our friends in the South have fought this at every turn, at every turn. We had a moment, by the way, we had a moment um, during Reconstruction. Astonishing things happened. And the Hayes Compromise. Again, um, there's a, I have a quote in here somewhere where I say, uh, it's been, it's, people are starting to say this now. What is it? It's, I say, oh, did I miss? Oh, to those who don't know history, everything seems unprecedented. This is why we got to know history. I've, I'm victim of this. Oh, my God. This is the worst time ever. Mm. No, it's not. It's pretty bad, by the way, because of things like social media, which just amplifies it. And, I, you know, this, this technology changes so quickly. I have, I have a Twitter account, but I have never tweeted. I've retweeted two things, I think. And friends of mine say, you got to get on Twitter, you got to get on Twitter. And I, I'm only resistant to it because I don't really, I don't want to learn another platform. I barely get on Facebook, and I love it. Why? Because it's completely addicting, and you can easily think it's real life as opposed to this. And so social media amplifies all of it. It makes, just think, it makes everything easier. That's all it does. It's a, there were always neo-Nazis in this country. Maybe one of them would take a trip and meet somebody in Europe who's a neo-Nazi. This just makes it easier. The good news is it makes it easier for us. It makes it easier for us to connect. 
for us to know what's going on. We can check our phones and see what's going on in the Nevada race now. So it, it's not inherently bad, but we've done a very bad job of uh, regulating that industry. Um, we've been so, I mean, post the late 70s, we've been such an open free market that we forgot. People don't even know what the word monopoly means. People, the kids, and we should le at least have a conversation about it. I'm not a really good socialist because I like free markets. I especially like the free markets of ideas and art and human behavior between and among adults. Um, but we ought to have conversations about it. And with respect to our history and history books, I can, I can quote you my um, fourth grade Virginia history book, which had, I think, I just told Sandra Murray this story, I think three or four paragraphs related to slavery, literally that's it. Um, and it was a pretty shiny portrait. Um, yeah, we absolutely, we, we, we absolutely have been brainwashed and lied to. We've lied to ourselves about it, you know. By the way, if you want something funny that'll make you laugh, I think it's on, I don't know if it's on YouTube or it's on Twitter. I have no idea why these guys did this. Two young black men, they must be comedians. They go to a Civil War reenactment thing. <laughs> dressed as slaves and they play the role and it's, it's so wrong and horrible and hilarious and the reaction of these folks they're mortified the guy's like well wait now this is civil war i just wore my uniform and he's got slaves please don't hit me and the guy's like stop 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 doing that stop stop filming so it's like you guys are reliving the civil war it's it is such it's again the power of art and in this case comedy okay sorry but yeah um i just want to thank you um education i think is aha moments <clears throat> and as you get older <clears throat> excuse me they're fewer and fewer listening to what you said as those young general students left this lecture I, I had a revelation why is it that we are prepared to pay as a culture 50 60 80 thousand dollars a year to keep young people incarcerated and we will pay that without a blink and we will do it for their alleged wrongs, which come from, I believe, a whole bunch of social things. If that's the only path open to you, that's the path you'll take. But we're not prepared to spend for giving loans and encouraging and rewarding young people for getting educated to contribute to society to the same level as we'll pay to incarcerate them. That had never occurred to me before, and I want to thank you for the revelation. Yeah, I would say, um, and I'm not saying, don't, please don't take what I'm saying as an excuse for folks. Think of all the forces that lead to that decision that we're going we're gonna to put somebody away. Think about all the implicit messages we've gotten and explicit ones we've gotten from social scientists. Um, let's not make it easy. We're not going to do the, um, we're not going to do an external cause of the criminality. Let's just say somebody's, this This kid has just been doing crime since he was a kid. He's totally, total criminal. Not a victim of their circumstances, right? Total criminal. We, on a human impulse, we want to punish people. We want to make them hurt. We, They did something bad, we want to do something bad to them. We're a kid in the schoolyard. That's part of it. We've been told they're bad. They're always going to be bad. There are bad people. There's a bad gene. We've, t we've been taught this. We have to keep them away from us. Unless, by the way, it's somebody's close to somebody that we know. Then, it's, then, then suddenly we can get flexible. With, but there are a lot of things, a lot of forces that have, that have impacted us and, and pushed us this way. And we don't talk out loud and have a question. Well, wait a minute. Should the state kill someone because they did something horrific. The kid who walked into the church in South Carolina, if anybody, if it's quote unquote, deserves a death penalty. But should the state do that? We should have a conversation about that. All of us should think about that. Not letting them off the hook, and you're right. Meanwhile, there's a whole bunch of other people who, circumstance, or think of all the people that are in jail for selling marijuana, and we're about to make millionaires from selling marijuana. So there, there are mostly black men in jail. The eight, they've gotten 25 year sentences. They're in year 18, 19 for something that somebody they're going to see on TV is going to get rich over. Right? We should have this conversation. We should be, but we can't let other voices dominate. Um, think of how some of these folks sound. I mean, they sound like, folks sound like children. 
if we talking, you know, you were talking about what our history books told us. I've had friends say, wait, 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 uh, nobody, no, wait, no one you knew owned slaves. He's not like a child on the school. If I say slavery is bad and it, and it, it has a big impact on my father not being able to go to William and Mary, you know, in, in the 1940s. I, I didn't own slaves. I didn't own slaves. He's not like a kid. Ask the question, how did it impact us? How? Well, let's talk about it. People don't walk around understanding the role that cotton played in this country's economy. They don't understand that New York State and New York City had half slaves laws. You were just a half slave? New York. Oh, yeah. Because they wanted the numerical count for the census. But I don't want to give these folks rights. Hmm. Because you're letting the South count their slaves as people. They, these are folks sitting around a table making decisions. I'm so... You know, so so again, I'm not trying to let folks off the hook. I'm saying those of us who have some awareness, we have we've got to buckle up even more. We we can't be depressed. And again, thank you, Pennsylvania, not just Pennsylvania, the entire country, because people turned out to vote. I think pe people turned out to vote. I think people are starting to recognize, you know, corny, you know, middle of the road, boring from Scranton, Pennsylvania, Joe Biden, starting to recognize what a great president this guy is. The guy's gonna, he, he's gonna go down as a great president. He is, I think. And this is, you know, I like to think I'm a pretty cool, hip guy. You wouldn't, ex you know, my 25 year old self doesn't think Joe Biden's cool. And I would say to him, stick around, kid, because this is precisely what we needed right now. Um, so we, we, we have work to do. Um, and, but we have a requirement. Oh, this is the, this, I wanted to make this point. We talk about, when folks talk about, changing um, policies and things in this country, particularly following the election of uh, our 45th president, President Trump. They talked about like, okay, there are all of these folks who feel left out, which is all true. They feel like their voices aren't heard. Absolutely true. Loves, da, 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 da. But we never talk about what's required of them to participate in democracy, for democracy to work. We can't let folks live on lies. There is truth. There's truth out there. We have to do a better job. I have to do a better job. <laughs> I tell people I have never been so warmly uh, disposed towards uh, President George W. Bush than when for our 45th president got elected. Suddenly, <laughs> don't agree with his policies. Huh, that guy wasn't so bad after all, it turns out. Right? And any demonization of him that I may have done, I've got to check myself on that. Which is hard, right? Because I like to think I'm right about everything. Yeah, my, my parents are laughing right now, too. <laughs> yeah. Wayne, Louis Armstrong, I think you've heard of him. Perhaps the best known voice in the world during his productive years. However, it has been indicated that he was passive in the struggle for equality. Just last week in the New York Times, I read that he was a strong advocate to the challenge of racism. Absolutely. What's the story? The, the story is the latter one. Uh, Ricky Riccardi and the Louis Armstrong House. Ricky is probably right now the country's foremost expert on Louis Armstrong, along with Dan Morgenstern, who's my predecessor at the Institute of Jazz Studies. Dan is 95 now um, and sharp. Still, his memory is incredible. Um, they are we, we, a lot of folks, um, the Black Power Movement, some folks in the Black Power Movement who didn't just do this to Mr. Armstrong, but to a lot of our elders um, who thought they were too passive. Again, it's the nature of being young. Um, and there was a lot of criticism of older Black folks during the post-civil rights movement and the Black Power Movement. Um, they criticized Black actors, Hattie McDaniels, um, uh, the actor whose name I'm blanking now, was Williams, who, play, who played the character Step and Fetch It. We don't know what those folks had to do. We don't know what they had to do to get their jobs to take that. We don't know what they went through. Um, and the same thing with Mr. Armstrong. And the stuff they may have been doing at home in their community and with his wife didn't get any press. And it turns out it's not necessary for everyone to get up to this podium. And uh, there are folks who have to do the work behind the scenes. And Armstrong did it. By the way, if he had only done music, <laughs> you're talking about this arguably the single most important musician in jazz history, literally redefined how jazz sounded. 
the jazz solos we hear at to go pull up anything Winton. Winton knows and worships the, the 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 way we hear jazz today, the way soloists swing and play that comes from Louis Armstrong. It really does. And he was a phenomenal musician. I've heard trumpet players say Oh, there was a summit of trumpet players, and they said, "Go and try to play some of this. It sounds so simple. Go try and play it." And then they get technical. Yeah, he's playing a C above high C. I can't. And it, he did it at the end of a five-hour recording session. So, as an artist, he was incredibly impactful. But he also was very important behind the scenes, from mentoring to supporting local organizations, the NAACP, the Urban League, and others. Uh, the benefit concerts he did. He was always very, very clear about it. And, and as I say, I think there's a whole generation of folks like that that we did a disservice to, uh, those of us who were younger, who, who didn't value what they'd done. Um, but as I say, to some degree, it's the nature of the beast. Uh, it's, I think it should be. I think I, there is an urgency. We need each other. We need their impatience. We need them to want change now because it's easy to... I'm, I, I don't go to demonstrations anymore. I'm too old for that. I think there's something else for me to do, but maybe I should go. Maybe I shouldn't be that angry. They need our wisdom. They need to understand, A, this fight is long, so prepare yourself, gird yourself. They also need to know, my 25-year-old self needs to know that compromise is a beautiful, wonderful thing. And my 25-year-old self hated that word, that, that, oh, compromise. We have to stand tall. We have to fight. We have to do what they do. Compromise is a beautiful thing. It is precisely one of the great things about this democracy. I get to go home and be me, and you get to go home and be you, but when we come together in the public square, we can talk to each other and use words like common good. Common good. Common wealth. Common wealth. Not me. Screw you. I got it. I'm right. We got to figure this out. It's no small thing. It's And it's a profound development in, in human history. What is it? Oscar Wilde, is it Oscar Wilde? Or was it, uh, oh my God, old age. Help me, Maury. Um, democracy is the worst form of government, except for everything else. <laughs> That's Churchill. Oscar Wilde said, the problem with democracy is that it takes up too many free evenings. <laughs> but both are true. Anyway, yes. I, I love where you start with Sandra and the idea that democracy is discussion. But you also use the name neighborhood and the, the, the uh, uh, congressman that you already know. It seems to me the key problem <laughs> that we haven't talked about is how you scale that up from a small congressional district to 250 million people. Term limits. Yep. <laughs> and I, I, Maury just threw this at me last night. He, they, they have no idea. I have dinner with them. They have no idea how much I'll think about and process it because I've been really like, eh, like that, I like institutional memory. You can't teach them how to ride a bicycle every year. We gotta have folks who already know how to ride the bicycle. But Maury was talking last night, and I gotta tell you, term limits. And we can talk about how long term limits. But gotta but doesn't do that require a discussion among the people that elect the guys? And women, yes. Okay, here's my other one. I didn't get to say this last night. Publicly funded elections. Period, end of discussion. Got to take private money out. And, te and television stations and ad agencies are going to lose their minds. Consultants are going to lose their mind because it is a ginormous. What was it? Somebody, I just saw, what was it? Uh, uh, Nine billion for, for midterm election? Wait, whatever the number is. It's just insane. Publicly funded elections. We have to do it. We have to do it. We have enough. There's enough bandwidth on... Uh, on the internet and, and television, we can, we can, yeah, publicly funded elections. We have to do it. I really think so. And it does have to be a conversation. And it's gonna to be tough because they're folk, they're vested interests financially. The, the, the current crop of folks don't, I'm astonished that we have, again, many folks in, in the party that I don't belong to hate government so much and are running for government yeah. and only want government jobs. They hate. Well, I love how uh, the, gov the, uh, the governor of Florida, uh, in the name of freedom, the only thing he wants to do is ban everything. Ban everything. Ban books, critical race theory, doesn't even know what it is. Ban kids who are struggling with their identity. 
ban, 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 ban. In the name of freedom. Okay, wait, let me ask a question. How do you guys feel after Tuesday? Congratulations. Um, so, I don't know if the folks who are in the Republican Party, I don't know if y'all saw CNN this morning. New York did horribly. I moved to New York from, to New, I moved from New York to Newark, I guess now, six, seven years ago. And uh, New York, the Democratic Party did horribly. The biggest one is the uh, congressional. Okay, so the young man who uh, defeated him is, the, the district that he won in is Hillary Clinton, Hillary and Bill Clinton's district and George Soros, among many other. It's New York, so there's tons of liberals, progressives around. I have to tell you, this is just one interview, this kid was great. Absolutely great. And I was like, wait a minute, this might be a Republican. The, where's the, we need him. I'm just telling, I don't know. I don't know what his policies are. He might be horrible. But he said, he says, man, there's 60,000 Democrats in my district. I had to get a lot of support from Democrats. He says, he says, I welcome Hillary Clinton calling me to tell me her concerns as one of my constituents. We need, we need, Maureen and I have talked, we need a good, we need opposition parties. I told you I like to think I'm right, but I'm not a lot of the time. <laughs> Right? And we need good opposition parties. So don't admit it, never admit it out loud. Anyway, thank you all so much for indulging me. I hope, I hope that was okay. I hope that was okay. Yeah, I think you I think you were okay. He thinks he was okay. But what do you think? Okay?